Okay, here we're going to begin chapter seven, uh, section 7.5, the unit circle approach. And so the properties of the trigonometric functions. So it says a unit circle is a circle whose radius is one and whose center is at the origin of a rectangular coordinate system. So here's our rectangular coordinate system with the x-axis and the y-axis. There's the center, zero, zero. And then you have um, an angle here. So this would be the initial side on top of the x-axis. And then the terminal side will intersect the unit circle. That point where it intersects the unit circle um, is the x, y that they're uh, talking about. And the angle from the x-axis to that um, terminal side is the angle theta. Okay, and we know this measurement because this is a circle with a radius of one. So from the center out to the edge of the circle, that measurement would be one because the radius is one. Okay, so it says on this unit circle, let theta be an angle measured from the positive x axis, so this side only, um, to the point P. So basically, you're just tracing along until you get to that point. It says fill in the values below to explore this. So if theta were e to equal 180 degrees, what would the point be? Okay. Well, this is 90 degrees. This is 180 degrees. This is 270 degrees. And then coming all the way around full circle makes it 360 degrees. Okay, it's also zero degrees because if I didn't move at all from the x axis, it's also zero degrees. Okay, so let's look at that. For um, positive 180 degrees means I go in this direction all the way 180 degrees. What are the coordinates of this point? The coordinates of that point would be negative one for x and zero for y. Then for 270, 270, if I go all the way around, positive 270, I'm at this point, and the coordinates of that point are zero for x and negative one for y. How about if theta were 90 degrees? That means I would rotate around 90 degrees in the positive direction, which is counterclockwise. I end up here. The coordinates there are zero for x and positive one for y. How about 360? So I start here and I open all the way around till I'm back to there again. And the coordinates of that point are positive x, one, positive one for x and zero for y. What if theta equals zero? Well, remember, we just talked about how this is the same as not moving at all. And if I go around one full rotation, I'm still in the same spot. So those coordinates would also be one, zero. And then what about if theta were equal to negative 90 degrees? That means I'm not going up 90 degrees, I'm going downward 90 degrees, which means I end up here. So theta equal to negative 90 degrees is the same as theta equal to 270 degrees. And we already know the coordinates here at 270 degrees, it was zero for x and negative one for y. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that um, sign of the angle uh, makes a difference on whether you're going upward or whether you're going downward. Okay. Now we know that trigonometry gives us the words sine and cosine to describe the relationship between the angle and the points on the unit circle. Keep in mind that any variable in this case, p, can be used to donate the, to denote the angle measured. So instead of using theta, you can use um, the letter T. So notice that here for the angle, instead of using theta, they're using the letter T. Um, definition, let T be a real number and let P be the point with X coordinate and Y coordinate on the unit circle that corresponds to T. The sine function associates each given angle T with the vertical coordinate Y of P 
and is denoted by sine of t equal to y. Okay, so that means that my y coordinate there can also be written as sine of t. Or if you're using theta to describe the angle, sine of theta. The cosine function associates each angle t with the horizontal coordinate of p and denoted as cosine of t. So whatever this x coordinate is, it is the value cosine of that angle. And whatever the y coordinate is, it is the sine value of that particular angle. So again, you can write the coordinates as x, y, but remember x is the cosine value and y is the sine value of that specific angle. So it says knowing this relationship, use a calculator set in the correct mode, degree or radian, to verify the answers found in part one. So we already know the answers in part one. We know that all of the x coordinates are the cosines, and we know that all the y coordinates are the sine values. So now what they want me to do is find these individual values and then make sure that they match what we have up here, okay? So the first one we're gonna do is sine of 180 degrees. So I do need to make sure that my calculator is in degree mode, and now it is. And then I need to do sine of 180, and I get zero. Now, how do we verify that with what's above? We need to make sure that the y coordinate for 180 degrees was zero. And up here, the y coordinate for 180 degrees is in fact zero. So we have verified that value. Let's go ahead and move on. Since my calculator is in degree mode, I'm going to go ahead and just um, do all the problems that have degrees. And then we'll verify those first. And then I'll put my calculator in radian mode and do all of those. So here we have sine of 360. And I get zero. Here I have cosine of 270. I get zero. Here I have sine of zero. I get zero. Here I have sine of 90. I get one. Cosine of 90. I get zero. And cosine of negative 90. I get zero. So I've used the calculator to find all of those values. Now I'm going to verify that they match what we had of up above. So for 360, since I'm doing sine, the y value should be zero, and the y value is in fact zero. For cosine of 270, cosine means I should be looking at the x coordinate, and is that zero? They do match. Then sine of zero means I'm looking at the y coordinate, and that is in fact zero. Cosine of 90 degrees means I'm looking at the x coordinate, which is zero, and I did get zero in my calculator. Cosine of negative 90 degrees would be the x coordinate, and I did get zero the same as up there. So I have this here. So those are all matching um, the values that we found in part one. Let's go ahead and now change our calculator to radian mode. So I'm going to go back to mode. I'm going to highlight radian and hit enter. And now it indicates that I'm in radian mode. I can quit out of there. And now I can type cosine of pi and I get negative one. Then cosine of two pi, I get one. Sine of three pi over two. I get negative one. Um, cosine of zero, I get one. And sine of negative pi over two. Oops. And we get negative one. Now we were not given any of the angles in um, radians. 
but we should know by now, um, you should kind of already have these memorized. This pi, I'm sorry, theta equal to 180 degrees is the same as pi. Theta equal to 270 is the same as three pi over two. Theta equal to 90 degrees is the same as pi over two. And theta equal to 360 degrees is the same as two pi. Theta equal to zero degrees is the same as zero radians. And then theta equal to negative 90 degrees is the same as negative pi over two. So now I know which radian angles go with each point, okay? So let's verify the first one, cosine of pi was negative one. So here I'm gonna look where the angle is pi and cosine means I should be verifying the x coordinate. I did get negative one for the x coordinate. So that is verified. The next one I'm gonna look at is cosine of two pi. So here's two pi and cosine means I need to look at the x value. X value here up here is one and what I got in the calculator is one. Now sine of three pi over two. Three pi over two means I need to be looking at, sine means I need to look at the y value. And up here we had negative one. And in the calculator, we got negative one. Cosine of zero radians means I look at the x coordinate for zero radians. And that's one and the calculator gave me one. Um, and then negative pi over two, sine means I look at the y coordinate, which is negative one, and the calculator gave me negative one. So these are verified as well. Now, from these definitions of sine and cosine functions, the following definitions are derived. Let T be a real number and let P be a point on the unit circle that corresponds to T. If X does not equal zero, the tangent function associated with, should be associated with T, oh no, it is associate. The tangent function associates with T the ratio of the Y coordinate to the X coordinate of P and is denoted by tan t equal to y over x. Now remember, y is sine of t, and x is cosine of t. So, and we already know that tangent is the same as sine over cosine. So it's all just fitting together. For cosecant, we know that that's one over sine, so the same as one over y. For secant, we know that is one over cosine, which is the same as one over x. And then for cotangent, we know that that's cosine over sine, which is the same as x over y. So we really have to get into the habit of x is cosine of an angle and y is sine of an angle on the unit circle. So <clears throat> here we have example one. It says, find the exact values of the trigonometric functions using the unit circle. Find the values below if P equals these coordinates. Is the point, is the point on the unit circle that corresponds to the real number T? So, um, we already know that the radius is one, and we already know that this is the X coordinate and this is the Y coordinate. And we know from the previous page that sine of t is the y coordinate. So this would be two square root of six over five. We know cosine of t corresponds to the x coordinate. So this response would be negative one fifth. Tangent we know is the um, y coordinate over the x coordinate. So two square root of six over five divided by negative one over five. And I can simplify that by multiplying the top and bottom by the common denominator. So then this becomes just two square root of six over negative one, which can be simplified to negative two square root of six. So the response here would be the re simplified answer, negative two square root of six.
For cosecant, we know that that is one over y. So one over two squared is six over five, which is the same as saying five over two squared is six. And we do need to rationalize that. So I need to multiply by square root of six, top and bottom. I get five square root of six over two times six, which is 12. So the reduced answer or simplified answer here would be five square root of six over 12. Now, secant we know is one over x, so we get one over negative one fifth. That's the same as flipping that over negative five over one, which is just negative five simplified. And then finally, cotangent, we get x over y, which means negative one fifth over two squared is six fifths. And then again, we can multiply by the common denominator. So times five, times five, both cancel. We get negative one over two squared is six. Again, we need to rationalize the denominator. So we get negative square root of six over two times six, which is 12. So negative square root of six over 12 is a simplified answer. And so that this example will help you to do number four in the homework assignment. Now, the homework assignment is very general, so assuming that you had um, heard the entire lesson. Um, so the problems are a little bit mixed up all over the place. So like you notice here, then I'll be talking about number two. So, so far, everything we've looked at has had reference the unit circle. What if the radius is something other than one? Although the sine and cosine functions are defined via the unit circle, similar triangles can be used to show that the sine and cosine can be used on any circle. Consider the following circle, where theta is defined in quadrant two, so it's over here, theta is in quadrant two, um, and so notice that this angle is the same for whether you're talking about this little triangle in here or you're talking about this bigger one. Now the little one has a radius of one. So the little circle is the unit circle. This other circle has some other radius. We don't know what that value is exactly. Okay. They're keeping it very general so that we can make some general points. So it says let P be the point on the circle. So this P is the point on the big circle. And we notice that that P value has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. So it has an X uh, distance here and a Y distance there. So if I wanted to figure out what that radius was, I would have to use the Pythagorean theorem that says one side squared plus the other side squared equals the <coughs> hypotenuse squared. Now P star is a point it says, notice that the triangles, um, O being the origin and A being the point where it touches, if you were to transpose it down to the x-axis, that's where it would hit it. So it's really like the x value. Um, so O star P or O star A and P star, this triangle here is actually similar to this triangle here. Okay, the only thing in the angle is still the same. The only thing is, is that the measurements are different because of the lengths of the sides. So recall from geometry that this means that the corresponding ratio of sides are equal as follows. So we know that um, that y over this radius or this length here which we know is one and then here the big one is the radius r okay so the unit circles y value over one is the same as y over r that ratio and similarly for all the others okay that's just basic geometry similar triangle um, information it says 
Now notice that this star is the y value on the unit circle. And we know that the y value on the unit circle can be written as sine of the angle. Therefore, if you were to solve, or if you were to just rewrite this, because sine over theta is the same, over one, is the same as sine theta. So now we have a rule for what happens when r is not equal to one. We can still find the sine. And we actually can use that same idea for every single one of these relationships to find out how we would calculate the six trigonomic functions from a point, even if the radius is not one. So remember, on the unit circle, the radius is one. And so this is a whole number y. And we knew that the y coordinate was the sine of that function. When the radius was one, we knew that cosine was the x coordinate. And it really wouldn't matter what the radius is here because when you do the, the ratios here, right, we know that tangent is sine over cosine. And so if I take y over r and then x over r, as soon as I try to multiply by the common denominator, I end up with y over x. So the radius is just fall out here um, due to the um, algebra. And similarly with the cotangent. Now cosecant we know is the reciprocal, right, of sine. And then secant is the reciprocal of cos, flipping those over to get the others. And we also know that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So now here it tells me in example two, it says find the exact value of each of the six trigonomic functions of an angle theta if three negative four is a point on its terminal side. So I'm going to graph it just so that I can visually see it. I am more of a visual person. So here's my origin and then one, two, three, one, two, three, four would be here. So that is the measurement there. I don't know what this radius is. I'm imagining that there's a giant circle, right? I'm not gonna draw the, I hate drawing circles. I'm very bad at it. Um, oh, I bought myself one of these little doodads. I forgot all about that. So, and these really, really help me because I, I again, I'm horrible at drawing. Just the worst <laughs> when it comes to drawing circles. So, I bought this little guy to help me draw circles because I knew we were going to need them um, in this class specifically. It wasn't too far off but it wasn't perfect either. What the um, circle would look like. I just don't know what that radius is, okay? Um, and it's not asking me to find the particular theta, okay? But we do have to transpose this point onto the x-axis, just like they did in this example up above. They took that point where it landed and transposed it down to the x-axis. I must do the same, always, okay? So it's over here on this side, so I'm going to transpose my point onto the x-axis and if I had drawn this correctly, it should have landed on that x value of four, okay? So then if I grab this triangle and I just draw it over here on its, on its own, okay? Here's my angle theta, here's my right angle, there's my radius. I know that this distance right here is, oh no, sorry, it's not four, that value is one, two, three. So I know this distance is three units. And then here down to here is one, two, three, four units. 
four units. But it is negative because I went down four units, right? So how do we find the radius? The radius we can find by doing the Pythagorean theorem. So three squared plus negative four squared equals r squared. So nine plus 16, I get 25. So five is the radius. And we omit the negative, right, when you do the square root because you can't have a negative um, radius, okay? So we know this now is five. So it wants me to find the six trigonomic functions. So we're gonna go for it. Sine of that angle is going to be y over r. So negative four over five. Cosine of that angle is going to be x over r. So three over five. Um, tangent of theta is going to be y over x. So negative four over three. Cosecant of theta is r over y. So five over negative four, or just negative five fourths. And secant is going to be r over x, so five over three. And then cotangent of that angle is going to be x over y, so three over negative four, or negative three fourths. And we have found all six of the trigonomic functions. Okay, so here we have, um, it says earlier we found that when theta is an angle in standard position and P is a point on the unit circle that corresponds to theta, that we had these um, values, right? Sine was Y, cosine was X, tangent was Y over X, cosecant was the reciprocal of this, one over Y, Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, one over x, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which is x over y, okay? So, um, just kind of making a table to put that together. And we already have another table for when the radius is not one. And this one works all the time, whether the radius is one or not. This values is only specific if the, we're talking about the unit circle, okay? So let's look at this next concept, exploration two. And then um, there's a lot of definitions for problem 7.5, uh, 11 through 15. And so a lot of that information is gonna be given here. So it says, use the definitions above to make conclusions about the domain and range of the following functions. To begin, make sure you are clear on what variable is the domain, the input, and what variables are the range, the output. So for sine of theta, the input is theta and the output is the y value, right? Because y equals sine of theta. This means that the domain of the sine function is all real numbers because theta can be anything, right? It could be positive and it could be negative. It could be any real number. But the range is only going to be negative one to one because those y values, since we're talking about the unit circle, the highest it will go is positive one, and the lowest it will go is negative one. Um, and if, if you're not clear on that, think of, again, a horrible circle. The y value here is pretty low, but it's positive. The y value here is positive, but it's not quite one because the y value one is up here. And the same thing with the negative. This is the lowest y value, which is negative one, and it can keep going to this y value, which is really, really close to zero. And we do have a y value at zero as well. So the lowest y value to the highest y value, that's where the range is coming from, okay? Now for cosine, um, theta is the input and the output is x, right? Cosine of theta equals x. So this means, again, theta is all real numbers, so the domain is all real numbers, and the range is negative one to one. 
this is how far left the graph goes, and this is how far right the graph goes, negative one to one in my x coordinate. It says tangent, the input is any theta that does not produce division by zero. Because remember, the output is y over x. So the um, domain is anything as long as x does not equal zero. Well, that happens a couple times. Where does it happen? It happens here at 90 degrees and it happens here at um, three pi over two. So the way, and it keeps happening. There's more keep going around and around and around, the more it'll keep happening, right? First time it's pi over two, three pi over two. If I go back, it's five pi over two. Um, no, I'm sorry, three pi over two, then it'll be, yeah, five pi. Yes, three pi over two, five pi over two, um, seven pi over two, nine pi over two, 11 pi over two, and so forth. So it's happening at every odd integer multiple of pi over two, okay? And the range is all real numbers because the range, um, is the value y over x. And depending on what the y value is and the x value is, that ratio is gonna give you a different value. The bigger y is and the smaller x is, the closer this will go to positive infinity. Or if this is a large number but negative, and this is a small number, it'll go to negative infinity. And vice versa, if this is going, um, getting really, really large, it'll get closer and closer to zero. The only time that you have a problem is when x is equal to zero, which happens at odd multiples of pi over two. For cotangent theta, the input is theta and the output is x over y. So now you have to worry about the y value not equaling zero. And where does that happen? That happens here on the unit circle and here on the unit circle which is all multiples of pi. Zero is a zero multiple of pi. Pi is one multiple of pi. Two pi is two multiples of pi. Then three pi, four pi, five pi, so on and so forth as it keeps going around and around, okay? So, and then again, just like before, the range is all real numbers because of that fraction. Now for the cosecant of theta, the input is any theta that does not produce division by zero, and the output is one over y. Um, again, this means that y cannot equal zero. And when does y equal zero? Integer multiples of pi. And the range is only going to be numbers that are greater than or equal to one or less than or equal to one. Um, I don't know what they mean by justify here. So I'm just gonna cross these out. I guess when I'm referring to the graph, that's what they mean by justify. So I'm gonna cross all of those guys out. Okay, so for the cosecant, remember that this is your output, right? So this is what you're looking at. You're looking at one over y. Now we know that y is a value between one and negative one which means it's a decimal number, okay? And when you have one over a decimal number, what ends up happening is that your values are getting really, really large. So one over, let's say 0 0.002, I get 500, right? So when you have one over a decimal, it's gonna get very large. Now, if this is one over a negative decimal, it's gonna be a very large negative number. So this is what they're talking about when they say, all real numbers greater than or equal to one, and then, or less than or equal to negative one, okay? So it, the denominator is a decimal, which makes the number really, really large, okay? Um, and if you wanna write that in the interval notation, it would be from negative infinity to negative one, and then from one to positive infinity. Nothing in between because the denominator is a decimal. Now here for secant, it says the input is theta and the output is one over x, which means the domain, the bottom cannot equal zero, right? And we already know from uh, talking about cos uh, 
what is it? Yeah, cosine theta, or no, I'm sorry, tangent, that x is equal to theta, x is equal to zero at all real number, or at integer, odd integer multiples of pi over two, which means the domain is gonna be all real numbers except those odd integer multiples of pi over two. And then the range is going to be very similar to that one, because again, the x value is going to be a value between negative one and one, right? It could be negative one to one, um, so it's gonna be there. It's gonna be some x value. So every single one of those points on the unit circle corresponds to an x value, whether it's coming from up top or the points are coming from down below. But every single point has a particular x value and every single one of those x values is between negative one and one. We just can't include negative one um, and one for the x value. Or I'm sorry, we can't include zero for the x value, which is why um, we can't include these values here. So when x is zero, you're at these points. And those points cause the denominator to go crazy, which means those particular points are not going to be in your range. Okay. Now, let there's a summary on page 572 of the ebook. So I'm going to try. I don't think I have that set up, but let me share my screen with you real quick and we'll go check it out. So I'm going to go to my home just so you can see what that looks like um let's do my laps plus and then let's go to multimedia library and i'm going to look at chapter seven section five and I want the textbook, find now. And it will give me that. And I'm gonna go to page 572. So it says I have entered an incorrect username or password. Let's try that again. No, it doesn't like me. Okay, fine. Um, let me go to my labs plus by myself. There we go. Let me sign in on my own. I gotta find my own classes because I see everybody's classes. There we go. I'm gonna try that again just because I don't think it was letting me use the student link to find it, but maybe now that I'm under my instructor um, access, it will let me find it. So 7.5 medium, fine now. Hopefully it doesn't give me a problem this time. No, it is still saying that I don't have permission to view this site. This is very strange. Let me sign out and then sign back in. I don't know if it has anything to do with that message, so let me see. Oh, last time. If not, you can always go to your ebook and find it. Um, I think another option we have is to go within the assignment itself. So if I go into the 7.5 assignment and it doesn't have the textbook here, but I'm just going to click on these real quick so I can open up the problems because there is an ebook link in your assignments as well. So let's go to question one. And let's go to question help. And we'll go to textbook. And let's see if it opens it now or if it gives me that error again. Hopefully it does not. Oh, it looks like it's going to work. Mm, yay, okay. So we want page 572. So 572. I'm going to hit enter. 
And this is the table I was talking about. So this table six um, is what you need to look at. It basically just has a summary of all the information we just had in these big long paragraphs. It gives you all of the um, six functions. It gives you all of their domains and then all of their ranges. Okay. So that's a nice little table to have if you want to put that on your note sheet, just so that you um, have all that information handy if you should need it, right? Um, you probably will need it while you're doing the assignment because there's about four or five problems that will ask you about that information, okay? So that's a nice little chart. You could also pause the video when you get to doing this and then just copy it down if you don't want to go navigate to the textbook to find it. So let's work on the next concept. It says determine the period of the trigonomic functions. So it says from section 7.4, we saw that the cosine of 420 degrees was the same as the cosine of 60 degrees. And that cosine value was one half. It says use your own words and or a diagram to explain why this is true. Now we know why it is true. It's true because they have the same um, terminal side. This line here and this point here is the same regardless if I went around just 60 degrees or if it went all the way around and then went another 60 degrees. That terminal side and that terminal point are still the exact same, okay? Now, it says based off of your explanation above, in general, we know that if you're given an angle, if you go full circle, you're at that same spot, right? And they put a K here because it doesn't matter if you go around the circle no times at all, then you have just theta, whether you go around one time and you have 360, or whether you go around two times and this becomes 720, whether you go around 500 times and this is some really, really large number, right? It doesn't matter how many times you go around and around and around, you're still gonna end up at that same spot, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you have it in degrees or whether you have it in radians, the property still holds. They will all still have the same Y coordinate. They will all still have the same sine value. And similarly with cosine, right? It doesn't matter how many times you go around and around and around, um, these values will still be the same, okay? So it says k is an integer because you could go around once, you could go around twice, 500 times, like I mentioned. You could even go in the negative direction once, or the negative direction twice, or the negative direction 500 times. Okay, it can't, or not at all, right? You're not moving at all. You're here and you don't move at all. So then k would be zero. Um, so then in that case, um, it says functions that exhibit this kind of behavior where you can add or subtract something to the angle measure and the values of sine and cosine functions remain unchanged are called periodic functions and in general are defined as follows. A function f is called periodic if there is a positive number p with the property that whenever theta is in the domain of f so is theta plus p. And f of theta plus p is the same as f of theta. Now that's exactly what we were saying up here. They just used f so that we can now talk about sine or cosine. We don't have to specifically say sine and then another definition for cosine. This definition is very general, okay? Um, now remember the property is, is that if theta if theta is in the domain, then so is theta plus p. If that's the case, then you have this periodic relationship, okay? So it says, based on this, complete the following statements for both radians and degrees. And so we already know from up above that the period of the sine function is going to be two pi or 360 or multiples of it, right? So, and the reason why is because no matter what we do, um, theta plus two pi k equals sine of theta, or theta of theta plus 360 degrees k is equal to sine theta. And similarly for the cosine, 
tangent is a little bit different. We have to go back and look at our tangent properties. Tangent actually has a period of pi or 180 degrees, okay? Because tangent has this property. And that can be seen from a previous section that we were working on, okay? Um, you could also verify it in your calculator if you just picked random values and then started adding multiples of pi to them or multiples of 180 degrees. Now it says, since the cosecant function comes from the sine function, it has the same period. Similarly, the cosecant function and cosine function have the same period, and the cotangent and tangent functions have the same period. So consequently, um, sine has this period, so cosecant also has that period. Cosine has this period, so secant has this period, and tangent has this period, so cotangent has that same period, okay? It says use the periodic properties to find these exact values. And so we have quite a few problems that we're gonna work on um, that require this concept. So we know, and we've done this before in another section, I can't remember the section exactly. I do record lots and lots of lectures, and so far this semester I've recorded almost 200 lectures. So <laughs> I don't quite remember every single one of them exactly. Now, here we go. Um, so this would be the same as saying 360 plus 30. That seem accurate, right? Which means that's the same as saying just sine of 30 degrees. I think in the past, we just kept subtracting 360. But it's the same thing as applying this property in this manner, okay? We know based on the period that that value is gonna be the same as this value. And then sine of 30 degrees, if you have it memorized, fantastic. If you don't, you can always use your calculator. Just do sine of 30 and we get one half. Or if you have a unit circle handy, you just look at the Y value where 30 degrees is, right? And you've got that um, ready. Now here, the same thing, we wanna write this as tangent of two pi plus something else. What is that something else? I have no idea. 19 pi over four minus two pi is actually bigger. So I probably need to do four pi. So minus two pi again. Now I am less than two pi. So three pi over four. And so this is a multiple of pi. And we know that according to that rule, it just has to be a multiple of pi. So this becomes tangent of three pi over four. So I actually shouldn't have been subtracting two pi because the period is not two pi. So 19 pi over four, I should have been subtracting pi until I got to a value that was less than pi. Um, so that is still an improper factor. Fraction, so I would just subtract pi for a second time. Keep track of how many times you subtract pi so you know how many multiples to put in front of pi. Now that's still an improper fraction, so minus pi again. That's the third one I've subtracted. That is still an improper fraction, so minus pi again. That's the fourth one I've subtracted. And then finally, I am left with the fraction that is less is not, is a proper fraction, right? The top is smaller than the bottom. Three is smaller than four. So now I have this, and then again, we can do tangent of, let's make sure we're in radian mode now, of three pi over four, and we get negative one. And so that would be the answer there. So you, all you have to do here is remember the differences though, because they could throw in a cosine, they could throw in a secant, they could throw in a cotangent, and you have to make sure you know the period of each one so you can get that relationship and be able to get the correct answer. Okay, we are now in exploration four, so we've got some problems. This is where a lot of our problems are gonna come from. Here, you're gonna have a lot of different kind of problems. They're not all gonna be exactly like this, but you are gonna use their properties, the even odd properties, the periodic properties. You're just gonna be throwing everything all together and going for it, okay? 
So this is actually even and odd properties. It says recall from earlier chapters and they mean college algebra. So recall from college algebra that a function is called even if f of the negative angle equals f of the positive angle. And f is odd if f of the negative angle equals the opposite value as f of the positive angle. So what types of functions are the sine and cosine functions? One is even and one is odd. Use the unit circle below to help you determine which is which, using theta as your input for x. So it says sine is odd, why? Because the sine of negative theta is the same as the opposite of sine of theta, right? Sine of negative theta, if I go downward here, that y value, sine is the y value, is negative y. Whereas sine of positive theta is the value y, okay? But the, and those are opposite signs from one another, right? So that fits the odd, um, the odd uh, definition. Now for cosine, if I have a positive angle, I have this x coordinate x. If I have a negative angle, I also have the same exact x coordinate x. So that's why this cosine value and the positive cosine value are exactly the same. Well, that's the definition of an even function, okay? And so to summarize, these are all of our um, even and odds. So the ones that have negatives are your odd functions. So this one is odd, this one is odd. Here we have more negatives, so these guys are odd. The only ones that are even are cosine and cosecant, because notice there are no negatives. They equal the exact same thing, okay? So now we're going to use these properties to find these values, okay? So cosine is 60 degrees. I know that cosine is even, which tells me that that's gonna be the same thing as cosine of, positive cosine of 60 degrees. And what is cosine of 60 degrees? I believe it's one half, but always double check just to make sure. Yes, one half. Now sine is odd, which means I will get negative sine of positive 390 degrees. And remember, we're gonna have to also use our period um, definitions here. So if I minus 360 degrees, because that's the period of sine, right? We get negative sine of 30 degrees. And so I know that sine of 30 degrees is one half, but let's just make sure. So that minus makes it negative one, one half. And then the same thing here. We know that for tangent, tangent is odd, so we can say that that is the same as negative tangent of 37 pi over four, right? In all of these, the angle becomes positive. And then I can take away pi until I can't take away pi no more. And I think for this one, we're gonna be here a while. 37 um, over, oops, over four. Oops, let me put the pi up there. Okay, 37 pi over four minus pi. And I don't need to keep track of how many, but I will just. So this is gonna be the same as negative tangent of whatever I get. So minus pi, that's twice, minus pi, that's three times, minus pi, it's four, five, six, seven, eight, still improper, nine. So I subtracted nine pi here and I got pi over four. And you can verify, it really doesn't matter, but we can verify 37 pi over four minus nine pi, just to make sure I counted correctly. And I did, so we've got that. And why are we subtracting pi? Because the period of tangent is pi. So you have to go by one pi and keep going until that fraction is, is proper. 
Um, and so then here, tangent of pi over four is, I believe, one. So I think this should be negative one. But let me verify. So negative tangent of pi over four. Oh, I am in degree mode. Mode radian. So let's go back up there and hit enter. And yes, it is negative one. Okay. So that is the end of this section, about an hour lecture. So um, if we were in a face-to-face -face class, we would have close to four hours of lecture every week. But we covered this section in an hour, so if we do about the same on the next two sections for this week, we should still be well within our, our, our normal class time of lecture. Okay, so I'm going to end this video here and then I guess you will hear from me again when we get to 7.6.